Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Power of Speaking, Rhetoric in American Public Life, an online professional development seminar sponsored by America in Class from the National Humanities Center. My name is Richard Schramm. I'm the Vice President for Education Programs here at the Center, and I'll be moderating this evening's session. Before we get underway, I'd like to spend a few minutes just to introduce you to the National Humanities Center. We are located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. We are the country's only independent institute for advanced study in all branches of the humanities. What does that mean exactly? Well, we're independent. That means we're a private nonprofit organization. We're an institute for advanced study, which means that the main program we offer here is a fellowship program that brings scholars from this country and abroad to the center for an academic year to research and write books on topics within the humanities, subjects like history, literature and language studies, philosophy, criticism of the arts, that sort of thing. We opened in 1978, and since then, more than 1,300 scholars have done research here, and that research has resulted in more than 1,300 books. Now, the place may sound like an ivory tower, and from you see, it's, as you can tell from its photographs, it looks like an ivory tower, but it's really not. Founders wanted it to reach a wide array of audiences, and they were particularly interested in reaching teachers. And we do that these days in a number of ways, and you can learn all about them by going to americaincass.org. And from that website, you'll be able to gain access to our anthologies and primary sources. You'll be able to find out more about our online seminars, our secondary sources, and our lessons. When you go to America in class, you'll see that little uh, icon that I have framed in red up in the corner of the page. If you click on that, that will take you to this page, which, from which you'll be able to order one of our wonderful little posters. We call it Picturing Monopoly. It says, Image of the Curse of California, which was a political cartoon that appeared in a publication called The Wasp on August 19, 1882. It's a wonderful image for, te for teaching monopolistic business practices of the late 19th and early 20th century. It is carefully annotated, and on the back of it, you'll find some tips on teaching that image, and you'll also find out all, all the things that America in class offers teachers. Now, let me remind you that at the end of this seminar, you can go to the America in Class website, the same website from which you received your readings, and there you will find a recording of this evening's sem seminar. You will also find a PowerPoint, and we invite you to plunder the PowerPoint, take whatever you want back into your classes. That's what it's there for. You will also find an evaluation. We ask you to uh, submit that to us. You can complete it and submit it online. We pay attention to what you say on those evaluations, and we use the, the, what you tell us to improve. Uh, the seminars we offer. Uh, once we receive your evaluation, we will send you an email, uh, it be a letter, that you'll be able to submit to your local certifying authority to obtain whatever recertification credit your, participa your participation in this seminar warrants. Now, let me just briefly tell you how we're going to be how we're going to work this tonight. Uh, you can uh, communicate with us, and we hope you do, by putting your cursor in the uh, little uh, uh, <clears throat> down at the end of bottom of your uh, panel to the right there, where that I have bracketed in green. Put your cursor there, type your message, click send, and your message will appear in the chat box above. I will be following the chat. I'll be bringing it into the conversation at appropriate times, and really, these seminars work best when we have lots of discussion. So we hope you'll, you'll do that this evening. Are there any questions now before we proceed? If you're ready to go, send me a smiley face. Let me see that, uh, that everybody's on the same page. So we're ready to move ahead. Don't see many smiley faces there. Come on. Let's tell me that you're ready to go. There we go. Now they're coming in. OK, great. So let's move on ahead. Our goals this evening are simple. We hope to provide you new material and approaches for use with your students. And we hope to demonstrate the role that rhetoric plays in public discourse. We hope to communicate to you four understandings. We hope you'll take these back to your classrooms and, and deliver them to your students. First, rhetoric, properly understood, is the best way in which we think and draw conclusions in language concerning any issue of complex evidence and appearances. For example, the financial meltdown and recession, our actions in Libya, taxes and deficits. That is, concerning any issue we can't reduce pure logic or quantitative reckoning alone, any issues in which there is no single accepted authority. Our second understanding, the language of effective polit politics, public affairs, and policies is conscious, crafted, invented, inventive, and aware of its audience. Let me repeat those, conscious, crafted, inventive, and aware of its audience. Rhetoric, in its true signification, does not mean cynical manipulation or spin, that is the proverbial empty or mere rhetoric. 
Yet rhetoric means more than good persuasion. It's the systematic study and art of using language, logic, philosophy, and ethics to frame, analyze, understand, explain, and persuade. <clears throat> Third understanding, in America, rhetoric was traditionally allied with moral philosophy and practical wisdom. This is how Jefferson, Madison, Douglas, Lincoln, and Susan B. Anthony understood it. In U.S. and world history, rhetorical power drives reform, revolution, and reaction. Finally, rhetoric plays a part in every major decision and social movement in U.S. history. It's a fundamental dis discipline for law, religious teaching of any faith, and academic learning. It's a prerequisite, though no guarantee of, all great leadership. It is essential to democracy. Now, we had a pretty good discussion of, of the topic on the forum. You asked uh, four questions. How has public rhetoric changed over time? Has it been dumbed down to meet the needs of a society that reads less and less? How does public rhetoric frame issues and shape our perceptions of them? What do the founding documents of our nation, the rhetoric of political campaigns and the long arc of civic and social justice, have to teach us about such concepts as liberty and justice, ourselves, our local communities, our nation as a whole, our individual and collective role in global society? And finally, is the power of a text's language and ideas, for example, the Pledge of Allegiance, made stronger by being spoken often in public, or is it diminished? Do the memorization and repetition of a text lull us into rote regurgitation without thought or feeling, or do they so embed a set of ideas and attitudes in our mind that they become an unconscious part of the way we interpret experience? Great questions. We're going to do our best to answer all of them this evening. And we, we have a few more questions. These are large framing questions that we'll be uh, looking at tonight as well. How, in these excerpts and in documents you might teach, does language reveal more clearly the actual reality of a given situation? Why can't a speaker just say, here's the way it is? How can language create a new idea, concept, or policy? Why do we need to interpret language? Why isn't it always perfectly clear to everyone exactly what the words everyone has in front of them mean? And finally, how can language establish a community of solidarity, making the audience a moral or political agent ready and willing to do something? For example, go to war or not go to war, vote a certain way, support or oppose legislation. Similarly, can language sow discontent and divisiveness? To lead us through all these questions this evening, we're very pleased to have with us James Engel, the Gurney Professor of English and Professor of Comparative Literature at Harvard University. Last year, James was a fellow at the National Humanities Center. His research interests include British literature from 1660 to 1830, comparative romanticism, criticism and critical theory, and German and English literature from 1750 to 1830. We couldn't possibly get all of his works on the slide, so we have just put a selection up there. And now let me turn the program over to James to tell us how rhetoric has worked in American public life. Jim, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Richard, and welcome to everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Many of you perhaps have not studied or thought about rhetoric in a systematic way before. That's fine. I never really studied rhetoric until about 15 years ago when I had already been teaching for 20 years. It's a subject that isn't often taught and I think it should be taught more, and it's beginning to be taught more. The elements of rhetoric are practical. They have a theoretical background and have had since the days of Aristotle, but they have lasted because they work. That is to say, people who have studied rhetoric have found it an effective way to learn how to communicate and to persuade. Okay, Jim, could, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but could you speak a little louder, please? Some of our folks are having difficulty hearing you. Yes, I'll turn up my volume some. All right, good, thank you. There, it's up about as loud as it can be now. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you loud and clear. I hope everyone else is. Please, go ahead. So the elements of rhetoric are practical, they're not outdated, they're powerful. And John Quincy Adams made the remark a long time ago, he actually taught a course in rhetoric at Harvard before he became president, John Quincy Adams said that in a deliberative democracy, rhetoric is absolutely essential. There's no other way for a people to govern itself other than by argument and the kinds of decisions that are made, say, in 
trial by jury. There are three basic types of rhetoric. Deliberative rhetoric, which is the kind you get in a legislature. Judicial rhetoric, which is the kind you get in a courtroom when you need to make a basic decision of guilty or not guilty, or when you're making a basic decision of good or bad. And then the third type is ceremonial, the kind of thing you might say on a holiday or at the dedication of a building or in remembrance of someone. There are five classical so-called canons of rhetoric. I wanna concentrate on the first three that are listed here because the, the last two have to do with oral delivery, memorizing and actually delivering. But the first three are inventing an argument, actually creating the elements of an argument, then organizing them, arranging them into parts, and finally, the style of language, the tone, the imagery, the vocabulary that you use. They're quite simple. Invention of a conceptual argument, organizing its parts, and then putting it into language which is pleasing as well as compelling. The five parts of a discourse have been around for hundreds of years. I think they're very good for students to learn. You don't have to worry about the Latin names next to them on the right. Introduction, which should be short. A brief narrative of how the situation has arisen or what the contextual information needs to be in order to understand that situation or issue. Then third, the actual argument itself or a set of arguments, usually with the most important one first. Then the fourth one is one that's often forgotten and one that students often don't include, and that is the rebuttal or counter argument. Because if you don't rebut someone, then your audience will say, well, he never thought or she never thought of what the opposition might say. It becomes very ineffective if you can't put yourself in the opposition's shoes. And finally, a conclusion, which is more than just a summary of the argument, it often elevates the whole emotional tone and energy to a higher pitch. So it isn't just a rehash of what was said in the argument. It often looks forward to the future and has frequently an inspirational aspect to it. So the three types of rhetoric, deliberative, judicial, ceremonial, the important things to remember about the canons, invention, organization, and style, and the five parts of a discourse. Those five parts, I think, will really come in handy if you teach writing or think about composition for your students. Now, there are also said to be three ways of persuading. These are Greek words, but the first logos just basically means logic. Syllogistic reasoning. Syllogistic reasoning will come to when we look at the Declaration of Independence in a few minutes. And this technical word, enthymemes, which means a partial syllogism. And I'll explain that when we come to the Declaration of Independence. But you need to use logic in almost every argument or rhetorical presentation, ethos. Ethos means not the reputation of the person who's speaking or writing, but how they appear at the time that they are speaking. In other words, how convincing and how sincere does the individual seem to be when they are actually making the speech or presenting the writing? And finally, pathos which doesn't mean pathetic here in our sense, it just means feeling or emotion or passion. So logic, ethical character, and passion or feeling. I'm not going to go through all these common topics now. The key thing to understand in what is called rhetorical topics are not that they are topics like subjects, but that they are topics in the sense of how you approach something. So if you assign your students a paper that says compare and contrast, that is one of the topics. That's the second one, comparison. These topics are quite old and established in rhetoric and they're very handy in order to analyze things. How do you define something? How do you compare? How do you see relationships? What are the circumstances of a particular issue? 
In other words, if things have happened in a certain way in the past, what is the likelihood that they will happen in the future? And finally, various kinds of testimony or evidence, meaning do you pull in authority, evidence, statistics, data, that kind of thing. So keeping these in mind, it's a lot I know to digest now, but keeping these in mind and referring to them later, I think will give you some good tools for analyzing speeches and analyzing um, any kind of composition uh, that has a political or social end in sight. These are time tested, they work pretty well. So let's take a look at the Declaration of Independence, part of it. One of the questions that would, I think is important is students so often regard it, many people do, as simply a statement, a declaration that the colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. We call it the Declaration of Independence. But how can we teach it as an actual argument? And I would say it's an argument in the form of a syllogism. And I've tried to outline that syllogism in orange on the screen. What's a syllogism? It's basically a three-part statement of logic. An example would be, all human beings are mortal. I am a human being, therefore I am mortal. In other words, you give a major statement or premise, then you give a minor statement or premise, and a conclusion, an inevitable conclusion, is drawn from those two. It turns out that the Declaration of Independence is a syllogism. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Then there are a series of clauses that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of the ends of securing life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government. That's the major premise. The minor premise is actually the vast bulk of the text of the Declaration of Independence, which are a whole series of examples about how the King of Great Britain has established absolute tyranny through various actions. He has, is repeated 14 times. His other violations are repeated eight times in clauses beginning with four, and then the declaration goes back to he has another five times. So that whole central part of the declaration is the minor premise. And you say, well, that's awfully long. Well, it's all kinds of examples about how the king of Great Britain has in effect created a form of government which becomes destructive of the ends of the people. Now, the conclusion comes at the very end of the declaration. The, the syllogistic conclusion, the logical conclusion is, given the fact that we have started to say these truths are self-evident and that any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it's the right of the people to abolish it and to institute new government, that the King of Great Britain has done exactly that. So we therefore, in the name and authority of the good people, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. It's a conclusion, it's a syllogism, and what's in blue is a kind of rebuttal, meaning it's not as if we have not requested that this be stopped. We have petitioned, we have appealed, but all of these things that are included in the minor premise, which violated um, the right of the people, we've done that and it did no good. So the actual conclusion is in the form of a perfect logical syllogism. It's really an argument, in other words, not just a declaration. It turns out that Jefferson, who wrote a good deal of the draft of the declaration, had studied rhetoric at William and Mary. He studied it under a, a professor. Small had an enormous influence on him. And he used a textbook by a man named Duncan. And in that textbook, it says that the most effective syllogism is one in which the major premise is a truth that is self-evident, meaning it's very hard to argue against it. 
So I happen to think that Jefferson carried that lesson all the way from the days of his own education and used it in helping to draft the Declaration. Now, I see one of the notes says, we argued against King, yet the Parliament was the problem. True, Parliament was a problem, a terrible problem, but the petition for redress and the appeal is to the British in general. Their native justice and magnanimity includes the British governing class and the British as a whole. So <clears throat> the idea is that the declaration really becomes a logical argument in and of itself. How can we teach that? I think it's important to do it. Let's turn to a second text, one that I think a number of you perhaps have looked at or taught, the famous Federalist 10 by James Madison. Here he's talking about faction and how to control it. He begins with one of the topics, which is definition. By a faction, I understand a number of citizens, whether amounting to a majority or minority, who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. In other words, how do you control a group, a majority or a minority, who want to do something which will be adverse to the rights of others? So Madison, who studied rhetoric, makes a kind of decision tree. There are two methods of curing the mischiefs of faction, the one by removing its causes, the other by controlling its effects. He says there are again two methods of removing the causes, one by destroying the liberty which is essential to its existence, the other by giving to every citizen the same opinions, the same passions, and the same interests. Well, just by reading that, you know that it's not practical to do either one of those two methods of removing the causes. And so he concludes the latent causes of faction are sown in the nature of man. So we're not going to get rid of the mischiefs of faction by removing its causes. We have to do it by controlling its effects. And that's the conclusion at the bottom of that slide. But then he says, by what means is that object attainable? Evidently by one of two only. Either the existence of the same passion or interest is in a majority at the same I must be prevented, or the majority having such coexistent passion or interest must be rendered unable to concert and carry into effect schemes of oppression. Well, you can see pretty quickly that the first one isn't going to work very well in a pure democracy, because if you have a majority, they will always win as a faction and create a tyranny of the majority. The only way to do it is to have not a pure democracy like a town meeting, but a republic. And that's where Madison then says a republic promises the cure for which we are seeking. Because a republic will be able to prevent the majority from concerting and carrying into, its, uh, into effect its schemes of oppression. The federal constitution forms a happy combination the great and aggregate interests being referred to the national, whereas the local in particular to the state legislatures. Hence, it clearly appears that the same advantage which a republic has over a pure democracy in controlling the effects of faction is enjoyed by a large over a small republic. In other words, the larger the republic, the more that you can tend to divide up the faction and the majority. And that is the best way of controlling faction. So it's a perfectly logical argument, which uses division and then uh, other topics, which uh, Madison does by looking at cause and effect and antecedent and consequent. It's a wonderful thing to teach students by trying to get a visual of it or a decision tree of it. I think you would be able to do that with Federalist 10 to great effect. It's, it really repays lots of study. I'm going to now look at a speech part of a speech by Frederick Douglass. Douglass was, of course, an, uh, enslaved when he was 
young, he escaped. And one of the first books he bought was a little book called The Columbian Orator. And from it, he learned rhetoric. Jim, if, if I, I'm sorry, yes. I could interrupt for just one second. Yes. <clears throat> we have a question here. Uh, could you explain what a decision tree is? Some of our folks are yes. familiar a with that. A decision tree means if you start out with a, a two choices and you decide that one is better than the other, then the one that you decide is better will lead to other choices. And then you'll go down that tree. So basically what Madison is doing is saying, is it A or B? Well, it's A. Well, if it's A, then is after A comes C or D. Well, we do C. And then after C comes F and G. Whereas if you went to B, maybe you'd say, if I choose B, it would be X or Y. And then if I choose Y, it would be you know, U or V. So a decision tree is basically a way logically of breaking something down and saying, first we need to do this. That's the most important thing. Well, there are two ways of doing that. One is not tenable. The other seems to be the right one. Once you do that, then you go down that tree. So it's really a path of making the decision. Okay, good. That could be a nice visual to use in a class. It's a wonderful visual. I think Federalist 10 should be taught visually. I really do, because it's not easy for students to read Madison's rhetoric. It comes at you pretty quickly. But if you actually put it up on a chart and show it with lines of decision, mm -hmm. then it makes Federalist 10 really quite clearer. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, let's move ahead then. Back to a slave is the 4th of July. Here we go. Frederick Douglass, former slave, asked to talk about the 4th of July. And, of course, he says, what to the slave is the 4th of July? This is a classic five-part uh, speech. And on the website for the forum, I think you have the opportunity to see the entire speech uh, and uh, to download it. It has a classic introduction. And I've given here the beginning of the introduction and the end. So each of these parts, I start the quotation with the beginning of that part and I end it with the end. So you can identify those parts in the speech. Then there's a narration in which he talks about the history of the 4th of July. And he goes back to 1776. And he says, it was your fathers and others who have claimed to be descended from those that participate in it. But of course, his ancestors didn't. But in this narration, he gives the history of the celebration of the 4th of July. And then he moves to the argument, to the now. That is, the narration of the past is over, so my business is with the present. And his argument can include several different elements. That America, by continuing to have slavery exist, is really false to the ideals of its past and its present, that it's a great sin and shame. That people who are black have equal manhood and equal humanity. And in that regard, he says, I really don't need an argument. It should be evident, but of course he does provide arguments. That slavery is unjust, it's barbarous, that it involves hypocrisy, particularly religious hypocrisy, and that the internal slave trade is cruel and inhumane breaks up families, and does terrible damage. Then he inserts the so-called pathetic part, which simply means the emotional part, an emotional part of the speech, where you really want to hook your audience. And he gives an image of a slave auction. And he says, I was born amid such sights and scenes. So we have personal witness added to this deeply emotional scene that he paints. Now, that's a rather small part of the entire speech because you can't keep that emotional intensity going for long, but it's very vivid. He talks about people being whipped. He talks about families being broken up. It's a very powerful part of the speech. And then he returns to the argument mentioning the fugitive slave law and the fact that uh, religion, particularly Christianity, is to be held responsible in its hypocrisy for continuing slavery. So there are the first three parts of the argument. And then he has a wonderful refutation addressing those who say that the Constitution guarantees and sanctions slavery. But he says, no, it doesn't. There's nothing he says in the Constitution that is pro-slavery. Now, of course, the Constitution didn't outlaw the existence of slavery, but he says, I defy the presentation of a single pro-slavery clause in it. 
That is an active statement that slavery is good. There's a wonderful statement in the refutation in which he says, I hold that every American citizen has a right to form an opinion of the Constitution and to propagate that opinion and to use all honorable means to make his opinion the prevailing one. That is really the basis of interpretation of the Constitution for all citizens who want to make an argument about it. You can say the Supreme Court is the final arbiter, and that is true, but anyone has a right to bring a legal case that might go up to the Supreme Court. I see someone says until 1808, that's true. In some respects, that was for the actual external slave trade that brought slaves into the United States. And that's when that ended. But of course, the existence of slavery itself was permitted uh, beyond that. So then he concludes uh, in a peroration that elevates the whole tone of the speech. He leaves off where he begins with hope, the hope of the abolition of slavery. And there's actually a wonderful vision of globalization near the end of his speech, if you go back and look at it. One of the earliest instances of it uh, in, in a modern way, he talks about steamships and uh, travel now so quick and, and the telegraph and other things. It's really quite remarkable. And then he ends with a poem uh, as a kind of inspirational poem. If you never taught Frederick Douglass's What to the Slave of the Fourth of July, I really hope you do. It's fairly long and you can abridge it for your students if you want to. It's also a marvelous thing to teach alongside Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham jail. It really is. It's a great classical oration. Douglas was one of the greatest rhetoricians in American history. Jim, we have some questions here that I'd like to bring in. Sure. Uh, it's a question that I'm sure all of our teachers uh, have to deal with. What are some of the best ways to teach speeches? Some of the speeches from the course readings are very long. Any tips out there? I would think, if I may jump in here, I may think that the model you're providing right now, where you divide it up into the uh, the forms of rhetoric, and uh, you know, you don't necessarily give the whole passage. You can condense it. Uh, that would give you a very uh, clear, systematic way to go through a speech, not only get at the structure, but get at the argument of the speech as well. Uh, what would you say to that? Yes, I think it's probably not the best strategy just to tell students to go read it and then come and we'll discuss it. Mm -hmm. I think the best way is to give them a passage or passages in advance for them to concentrate on and ask a question or questions about those passages to get them hooked into something that they can think about particularly. Now, for something quite short, it's a little different. And there are some good ways to um, teach shorter versions. There's one book called In Our Own Words I mentioned in the forum, where the selections are usually no more than two or three pages at most. But even then, you want to concentrate on more particular things within the speech. So you might say, what's the main argument here? Or what is the reputation? Or what kind of audience is being addressed here? And what does the speaker want the audience to do? I think breaking it down is important. Giving students a whole lot of text and just expecting them to come back to be ready to discuss it doesn't, doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I also think. In part, uh, you might try things like a PowerPoint and highlighting things. So instead of people all looking at a book at the same time, they're doing something of the kind that we are. That is to say, they're looking at things together visually, and you can use your PowerPoint to highlight text. Um, there are also video clips that you could use to have people listen to a lot of speeches from the 20th century. A lot of them are available on the internet. So I think there are different ways. The main point is to break it down, be specific, use shorter passages, and then from that, try to fan out to some of the larger implications uh, of the entire speech. And some speeches are simply too long for classes. I mean, I, I have never been able to get a class to, to do, say, all of Obama's speech to the Muslim world. It's quite long. And even Frederick Douglass's address, I always break that down and just, just do parts of it, actually, in class for discussion. Okay, and another question here. The question I get a lot is, which of the three modes of persuasion is most effective? I always answer this question by saying that it depends on the audience. I think is that's right, true? and on the situation. Because um, a speech without any logos 
probably doesn't work. In other words, if there's no logic to it and it's a purely emotional appeal and it's, it's based purely on one's sincerity, it usually won't sway your audience. Almost every effective address, particularly anyone that's longer, has to have a logical argument to it, a kind of spine or structure of logic. And does it have to have um, uh, some sort of passion or feeling? Not necessarily. I would say, for example, Federalist 10 has not got a very high emotional temperature to it. But it, that's, after all, written in a cool way for an audience that's going to be reading it. Uh, if, on the other hand, you're addressing a group of people and you really want action, you really want to uh, energize them, uh, emotion and inspiration seems essential. And then um, the, uh, the ethos, well, whenever you speak or write, your ethos will at some level be gauged by your audience. But often it's important for a speaker to try to talk about their involvement with the subject or their background or what they've done uh, with it before. So I would say really good speakers have succeeded in always using logic, frequently using uh, feeling, especially depending on their, on their audience, and ethos comes out one way or another. There are ways you can highlight it by talking some about yourself, but of course, if you talk too much about yourself, then people won't like that either. So you have to find a way of carrying your own presence in the speech and making your audience feel as if you and your audience are bound together in some kind of way, that there is a community or solidarity. When John Kennedy in his inaugural address says, let us, instead of you should or we must, that let us is a way of saying we are together moving forward. And that creates a kind of ethos. It creates a kind of ethical sensibility in the audience and the speaker. So I hope that helps. There's no rule about these things. Um, a lot of it is situational. Um, Abraham Lincoln, 1858, giving his house divided address. Here is a situation in which he basically puts his conclusion right near the beginning of the address. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. It will become all one thing or all the other. Very often students wait until they have finished their paper and in the conclusion state what their real argument is. I don't know if you have had that experience grading or reading papers, but it's only at the end of the paper that the argument really comes out well. Lincoln knew that it could be very effective to state a conclusion right up front and then reason your way through it. He does that in this speech because a house divided against itself cannot stand and the next two lines are all right at the beginning of the address. Then much of the rest of the address is this masterful presentation of logical evidence in which he says that given the Kansas-Nebraska doctrine and the Dred Scott decision by the Supreme Court, we had a situation in which there was fundamentally a kind of conspiracy, what he calls a piece of machinery. And it was designed by individuals to do something, and that was to preserve and permit the spread of slavery. So Lincoln goes through this address and says three points were gained by this machinery. No slave or descendant would ever be a citizen. Neither Congress nor a territorial legislature could exclude slavery from a territory. And holding anyone as a slave in a free state is not subject to the US courts, only to state courts of any slave state the Negro may be forced into. These were the points gained by the political and judicial decisions of the 1850s from 1850 to 1858. Lincoln says we can't know that all of these adaptations are the result of pre-concert, that is of a conspiracy. He says with a wonderful image, but when we see a lot of framed timbers and when we see these timbers joined together by Stephen Douglas, by Franklin Pierce, 
and by Roger Taney of the Supreme Court, and by James Buchanan, and see that they exactly make the frame of a house or a mill, it is impossible to not believe that Stephen and Franklin and Roger and James all understood one another from the beginning before the first lick was struck. This is a terrific example of evidence that is not airtight, but based on probability. Lincoln was a really good lawyer, and he knew that beyond a reasonable doubt, in a criminal case or preponderance of evidence in a civil case didn't mean that you had absolutely beyond any doubt proven your case. It simply meant that you had made it highly probable to your audience. And that's what he's doing here. And that's what almost all deliberative rhetoric does. It doesn't completely prove. It makes the audience believe that something is far more probable. So this is one of the great conspiracy theories in US history. And Lincoln is saying it existed and it existed between these individuals over a period of a number of years. This was a marvelous speech for Lincoln, really helped forward his political career. He gave it at the Republican convention in Illinois, the state convention in 1858. It's a terrific speech for Logos. It's also got a great conclusion, a great peroration, which is filled with a lot of inspiration and force. The Gettysburg Address, probably a lot of your students know, and it almost it dulls us perhaps when we begin four score and seven years ago. I think there is a, a way in which repeating things frequently does dull us to them. So rather than concentrate on that, in which when Lincoln begins it, he's basically for not even doing an introduction, he's jumping right into the narration four score and seven years ago. I want to concentrate a little bit more on the latter part of this short address in which he connects the living and the dead. It's a ceremonial address. So he's going to talk of people who have struggled and died on that battlefield. And he's going to basically use forensic rhetoric here in the sense he's going to judge whether what they did was good or not good. And he's saying, in fact, it was so good that they have consecrated something. They have made it sacred. So the living men must now dedicate themselves to the unfinished work of the dead who fought here. So the living must dedicate themselves, he repeats the word dedicated, to that task, so that from the dead, the living take increased devotion for that cause for which the dead gave the last full measure of devotion. So that we, the living, resolve that the dead shall not have died in vain, because the living will carry out what the dead had tried to see done. And in this marvelous set of sentences here, Lincoln links those who are no longer alive with those who are alive in the very same struggle so that there becomes an unbroken chain between the dead who are there in the very cemetery, not more than yards from where he is speaking, and the living who remain. There is a kind of logos here, a kind of logic, meaning if we care about what the dead have done, we will continue to do what it was they were doing. And the living and the dead, therefore, become as one. That is to say, there is no separation between them. It's hard to imagine a greater sense of unity or of solidarity than that. Having said that, Lincoln says that if that is done, then this nation shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. In other words, it, it shall not die if the living continue to do what the dead have done. And underneath of all this, of course, is a deep undercurrent of emotion because the dead are constantly invoked, not in any um, high and florid 
language, but simply as the dead, those who are still with us. Jim, you, you mentioned, <clears throat> uh, you alluded to a question from the form when you said that <clears throat> repetition does dull our sense of a text, and that's certainly true. But would you not also say, though, that it does embed some ideas um, deeply into our consciousness? For example, of the people, by the people, for the people. Though That's a string of prepositional phrases that I think most Americans would know, and it's really a brief, powerful expression of a democratic ideal. Uh, could could you comment on that? Does yeah. that repetition, does that knowledge, you know, help us uh, uh, in, uh, hold to that idea? Yes, it does. And um, you know, it's funny you should mention repetition because this exact wording is Lincoln's, but it comes very close to similar phrases that were used. One, I think, by Daniel Webster or uh, another member of Congress as early as the 1820s. The phrase that Lincoln uses, the last best hope of earth, was a phrase that was used by other people before Lincoln used it. And of course, Lincoln's own words have been repeated later by uh, other presidents uh, as a kind of echo chamber. So that repetition creates a kind of theme that echoes down through the ages. And that I think is good, uh, but when it becomes um, simply something that people mindlessly repeat, and I mean, the, there was a question about the Pledge of Allegiance. Right. If you simply memorize something and have to say it with a lot of other people all at once, maybe it gets into your psyche, but maybe after a while you're just not thinking about the words, you're just thinking about saying the words. And, and there's a big difference. If you're actually thinking about the language, you see things in it that you haven't seen before. If you're just thinking about saying it, you're kind of on automatic pilot. And, and I, I think it's a great challenge in teaching anything to dig deeply into language and see what, what it is really saying. I mean, I must have read the Gettysburg Address 50 times if I read it once, maybe 100 times. Each time I read it, I see something in it that I haven't seen before. Some kind of repetition, some variation of words, something that makes me understand its artistry. Lincoln studied rhetoric. He was not untaught. He really read a lot in his 20s and 30s, including books on rhetoric and elocution and poetry. So he was someone who learned this like Douglas did. So it's the repetition is really a matter of context, um, why you're repeating it, the context in which you're repeating it, and sort of the way you repeat it. Yes, I think so. And it, it, that kind of repetition um, can be highly effective. There's repetition in uh, 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 various speeches that works well, but for whole groups of people to repeat things in unison, I think that's a slightly different case because yeah. there, there, you, there you have uh, something which might not be done reflectively. Um, okay. Could be, but it's hard to say. Yeah, we got about 45 minutes left to go, Jim. All right. Well, I want to turn to FDR's first inaugural address. In those days, it was given in March, not in January. It's ceremonial, meaning it's an inaugural, so it's something that's done every time a president takes office. But I think this address is also deliberative. That is, it's making an argument. And it uses extremely interesting imagery, and it ends with a call for action. I want to take a look at uh, imagery in the address. It begins with some religious imagery national consecration. That's uh, continued at the end of that paragraph with the statement about the self-seekers have no vision, and when there is no vision, the people perish. This is from the book of Proverbs. It's a biblical quotation directly. He then says, the money changers have fled from their high seats in the temple of our civilization. This, of course, is another allusion uh, to um, sacred scripture, and it's an allusion to Jesus having cleared the money changers out from the temple. So there's a strong religious imagery in this. It's not particular to one kind of doctrine or dogma, certainly, uh, but it would have resonated and continues to resonate with the American people. But then when he says that now the money changers have fled, and it's rather effective because he says they're gone, even though all of them haven't been, but he wants to clear the table. He says now 
It is a time for action. Our greatest primary task is to put people to work treating the task as we would treat the emergency of a war. And this is the introduction of the second great kind of imagery in this inaugural address. This is a war against the depression. Now we know that sometimes these wars can be more successful than at other times. The war on drugs has perhaps not been such a successful war. The war on poverty has had mixed results. But calling a nation to war, not against a foreign enemy, but against an internal crisis is something that Roosevelt did supremely well. He then says the task can be helped by, and he states that five more times, meaning various policies. He enumerates those policies. We must act and act quickly. And one of the ways he says we must act is that there must be a strict supervision of all banking and credits and investments there must be an end to speculation with other people's money. I like some of this language because I think some of it has pertinence today as well. I think there are certain echoes in the situation of the Great Recession and the Great Depression. But the main point of this I just want to call attention to is that he goes back to this almost military imagery. He says, these are the lines of attack. Then there's a kind of refutation here a bit. He says, you know, if Congress doesn't act, I shall ask Congress for broad executive power to wage a war against the emergency as great as the power that would be given to me if we were, in fact, invaded by a foreign foe. And, you know, we all know that Roosevelt tried to extend the power of the presidency. He, he tried, in essence, to pack the Supreme Court. There were a lot of things he felt he needed to do in order to act. And for, for the most part, Congress went along with him and passed a lot of legislation, particularly in the first hundred or so days of his administration. But then it's marvelous that he says uh, near the end of the address, the people of the United States have not failed. Um, the first inaugural of Roosevelt repays a lot of study. Uh, there's also a seasonal imagery in the address in which he talks about the withered leaves of fall and the coldness of winter. And then he says what is now needed is something that is warm and secure. And there's almost a sense of the country turning from a cold and desolate late fall and winter to spring. And of course, he gives the address in March when spring is just breaking out. So although some of these words and images in the speech might appear simple, I think they had a very strong effect on people who were cold and hungry and out of work. This address really gave the country a lift. They didn't have so many sophisticated public opinion polls then, but the result of this inaugural really did elevate the optimism of a number of people. FDR gives another address some years later famous for the four freedoms. And here's a simple use of the topic of division, which I think students don't use often enough. That is just to say, there are four important things here, one, two, three, four, or I'm going to divide my argument into three sections, one, two, three, and then actually say that. Time and again, American political rhetoric is filled with this simple device of division because it's effective. It's not too elementary to use. It's actually very, very forceful. Also, you say, what are all those fancy colors near the top? I wanted to point out that there's style and sound in the best of addresses. So I put in red in the top two lines, the words that begin with F, future, forward, founded, for, and freedoms. And then that little italic U in future is echoed by the hue in human in the second line. The W which is echoed in the W we and the W world. That's why they're in italics. And the E's in yellow are long E's. We seek, we essential freedoms. And really good speeches have a, a they're like playing a musical instrument. So I just wanted to use those two lines to exemplify that. The division comes with some repetition. 
The first is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. The second is freedom of every person to worship God in his own way everywhere in the world. The third is freedom from want everywhere in the world. The fourth is freedom from fear anywhere in the world. Slight variations like that, which seem rather simple on paper, end up being very effective when read, but very effective, especially when delivered. We have a <clears throat> sharp-eyed participant who found a slant rhyme in We Seek and We Look. Yes, yes. And, you know, one of the things I ask students to do, and it's very helpful, is have someone read your paper out loud to you while you are not looking at it. In other words, if a student can hear what they've written without having that crutch of the language in front of them, they often get more critical about it. And they often hear in good compositions, the music and the good writing. Sometimes students get so involved with defending their own language on paper that they don't actually hear it. And if you can get people to hear what they've written, I think it's marvelous. One of the points I wanted to make about FDR's speech is its globalizing principles, which has been common in a lot of American political rhetoric. Abraham Lincoln himself talked about America as the last best hope of Earth. And there's always been a sense that the freedom that America has espoused politically is a freedom that comes from the natural right of any human being simply by existing as a human being. That it is not bestowed by the state, it is not the creation of the United States government, it is an inherent and inalienable right of any individual. So in this address, the Four Freedoms Address, FDR says that the way we have achieved that has been to be engaged in change and in a perpetual peaceful revolution which goes on steadily, quietly adjusting itself to changing conditions without the concentration camp or the quicklime in the ditch, referring to the quicklime that you would throw on bodies in a mass grave before you were going to cover them up. So there's a sense in FDR, there's a sense in Lincoln, there's a sense in Ronald Reagan, there's a sense in every president and many other figures that we are making a more perfect union. And of course, students say, how can something be more perfect? Isn't perfect perfect? But in the 18th century, more perfect simply meant more worked through, more improved, just came from the Latin perficio. So to say something was a more perfect union meant that it had evolved or improved to some degree. It's a great theme in so much American political rhetoric, I believe, because most anything that's good takes a long time to achieve. Abolition took a long time to achieve. Women's suffrage took a long time to achieve. Union rights for people took a long time to achieve. So all of this rhetoric has to look forward to a sense of evolution and, and struggle to some degree. Jim, we have a question here. We talked about the different types of rhetoric. There's rhetoric to deliberate, there's rhetoric to, provo to, to uh, uh, move people to make decisions of right or wrong or guilt or innocence, and there's rhetoric to celebrate and ceremonial rhetoric. We have a participant here who's asking about the rhetoric that gives hope. He notes that a lot of the speeches in the course readings deal with hope. Yes. Um, would that would the would the the idea of using language to to inspire hope would that really deal more with uh, the delivery in which uh, of course what the content of the speech but could you comment on how how one uh, might uh, how rhetoric figures into inspiration inspiring people which I think is what we're talking about when we talk about hope in so much American political rhetoric it's done by looking forward to the future uh huh. Uh, whether someone is in a political campaign or someone is talking about a certain kind of social or political struggle, the idea is that the future, the, the new frontier, uh, the new deal, um, making America um, um, great again, all of those forms of inspiring people have to do with this wonderful and almost inexhaustible sense that um, this country has a habit of self-renewal and it has the kind of inner resources to reinvent itself constantly. 
and pull itself up by the bootstraps. So much of this has to do not only with looking to the future, but also with creating in your audience a sense that this can be done together with some kind of unity in the country. Now, of course, we all know we have at least two and often more political parties, and they can be very partisan and bickering and separate. But when a, when a president particularly, or uh, many public figures speak, they often feel quite rightly that they are not speaking for their political party, uh, that they are speaking for the country and that they must speak for the country, that, that they are the chief executive of the country or they are a representative of a very large number of people. So there's a kind of responsibility there in creating hope. You are creating a kind of solidarity and a feeling of looking forward, not just simply looking forward, but looking forward to achieving something together. That sense of togetherness is so important. At the end of Lincoln's address, for example, in the House Divided, he assures people, he says, but the victory will be ours. He says, we shall move forward. So I think that it's a sense of both looking forward, but it's also a sense of we are part of an actual community. And the more that that sense of, of uh, being a group that has a cohesiveness uh, can occur, the better. In times of war, that cohesiveness often naturally occurs because we're threatened externally uh, or we've suffered some kind of grievous loss. But at other times, it's harder to create uh, and it has to be done in a way that is um, more inventive than simply pointing to an enemy. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got about 30 minutes, Jim. All right, well, here's, here's Margaret Shea <clears throat> Smith. Uh, senator from Maine in 1950, and she has become extremely worried that um, something has gone wrong with American political rhetoric. And she was right, something had gone wrong. Um, this I say in the subtitle is deliberative about deliberation. Well, she has become alarmed at extremist rhetoric on both sides of the aisle. She is thinking of the Red Scare, the various kinds of witch hunts, the accusations, and then the counter charges, which were also ugly from the Democratic side of the aisle. Margaret Chase Smith has become so worried about this kind of invective and ideological posing that she gets up in the Senate in early June 1950 and says that she wants to give a message for she speaks as a Republican, I speak as a woman, I speak as a United States Senator, I speak as an American. A very effective use of certain kind of repetition. Yes, she's a partisan. She says that the nation needs a Republican victory, but I do not want to see the Republican Party ride to political victory on the four horsemen of calumny. Calumny is a kind of slander, fear, ignorance, bigotry, and smear. Then she, as a woman, wonders how the families, the wives, mothers, and sisters, and daughters feel about the way in which members of their family have been politically mangled in Senate debate. And she says, I use the word debate advisedly. She is worried that the Senate has been made a publicity platform for irresponsible sensationalism. So she's using the topic of division. She's speaking as a Republican, a woman, a senator, an American. but. The main reason she's speaking is because she feels that rhetoric has gotten out of hand. And like anything powerful, whether it's oil or the atom or the imagination or genetic engineering, rhetoric is so powerful that it can be used for ill as well as for good. It can divide as well as unite. It is true, alas that one of the best rhetoricians for charging up a crowd in the 20th century was Adolf Hitler. Would that he had never had the rhetorical gifts he did. So rhetoric alone is not sufficient. That's one of the reasons why in American educational history, you were supposed to teach moral philosophy or what we would call ethics along with it. So Margaret Chase Smith is shocked at the way Republicans and Democrats are playing directly into the hands of the enemy, as she sees it. The enemy 
whose design is to confuse, divide, and conquer. As an American, which is her climax, her, you know, she builds up, she begins as a partisan, then she goes to her gender and then her position, but finally as an American, she wants to see the nation recapture the strength and unity it once had when we fought the enemy instead of ourselves. This speech is rarely cited and rarely taught, but I think it's a wonderful address by someone at the time when the nation was um, dividing itself and often looking for enemies within. And she is able to see that this involves a certain amount of danger, a danger perhaps as great or greater than the danger posed from external enemies to the country itself. <clears throat> Presidents sometimes used to give a farewell address. Washington did, of course, it's a famous one in which he talks about not being entangled in European affairs. It's also a farewell address in which he calls for a national university because he felt education was so important. We never got a national university, though we did get land grant universities. Well, here's Eisenhower's farewell address. And most of you may know it for the, for the fact that he guards, wants the nation to guard against the military industrial complex. And we'll get to that because it's part of the excerpt here. But before that, I wanted to call attention to something he says, which is deeply important because it highlights the quality of judgment. I'll talk about that in relation to this first excerpt. He says, we have a need to maintain a balance in and among national programs, a balance between public and private, between cost and hope for advantage, between what's clearly necessary and what's comfortably desirable, a balance between what's essential as a nation and the duties imposed by the nation upon the individual, a balance between actions of the moment and welfare in the future. Good judgment seeks balance and progress. Now, at one level that sounds pretty obvious, but one of the things that rhetoric tries to teach is a sense of judging the probability of the outcomes of certain courses of action. In law school, of course, there are no courses on judgment, yet being someone of really good judgment is considered to be the highest value in law in some respects. One aspires to be a judge, a judge in a higher court, maybe even a judge in the Supreme Court for the quality of judgment one has, yet it's extraordinarily difficult to teach. And what Eisenhower is calling for here in his farewell address, I believe, is a sense of civic duty and civic virtue, which is impartial and tries to see a balance or what we would call trade-offs in such a way that it actually brings practical wisdom. Because that's what anciently and currently rhetoric in its widest signification really hopes to achieve, a way of using language to take wise actions. One of the main points of this address is Eisenhower himself saying, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence by the military industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. I think in part Eisenhower could say this and have it remain as so memorable because he had been a great military leader. He had uh, led the Allied effort in the Second World War. He knew the military inside and out, and he understood the dangers that the military industrial complex might pose to the country. His ethos, in other words, was a great help to him in this. If someone who had been known as an individual who criticized military budgets constantly or who was not supportive of the military made these remarks, I think they would have fallen flat. It was the fact that Eisenhower made these remarks, I think, that has given them such weight. Before urging disarmament negotiations, which he says he has failed in as a president, interestingly enough, Eisenhower was a big enough person to say that he failed in them. 
he says that the real way to compel the proper meshing of the industrial and military machinery is through a knowledgeable and alert citizenry, that this is the only guarantee of real balance. You go all the way back to Benjamin Franklin or George Washington, and they all say you can have a really great constitution, you can have wonderful laws, but if you don't have a knowledgeable and alert citizenry, then the government will crumble from within over time. That's why Washington called for a national university in order to provide an alert and knowledgeable group of citizens. So beneath all this is the sense of education, of having a citizenry which is capable of understanding these issues. Jim, going back to that, just to the Eisenhower address for, uh, for a moment, yeah. um, could you comment on the use of repetition in that first paragraph? How generally sure. effective is that? Let's go Very back. Quick. I think, you know, it's more effective often in a speech to have this kind of repetition than in a composition that's simply going to be written. Because if you were simply reading something in your study or sitting in a train or on an airplane and reading it, it wouldn't have quite the same effect as hearing it and knowing that a lot of other people were hearing it at the same time. This kind of repetition works very often in public addresses that are delivered orally. I think it works a little less well in things that are written simply to be read. So for example, this kind of repetition you might find in an inaugural or in a nominating speech or in a campaign speech. But would you be likely to find it in a, in a newspaper editorial? Probably not so much. You might, but it probably wouldn't work so much there. What's the reason for that? Well, in a speech, when it's being delivered, you don't have time to go back and reread it. You're just listening to it. And you're actually sometimes trying to keep up listening to it. So the repetition has the effect of novelty and of driving things in, because there's no text to look at. Whereas if you're looking at it and reading it, your eye might wander back over it, you might reread it once or twice, and the repetition loses that immediacy of effect. Now, in general, I think a lot of students write too much as if they're writing, and they get convoluted and difficult sentences, and they often ought to write a little more directly as if they were simply speaking in a direct way. But some of the effects of, of um, orally delivered rhetoric don't come off so well on the page, and constant repetition is probably one of them. But this, of course, was an address delivered uh, on television, and it was delivered, therefore, orally to millions of people, and I think that's one of the reasons why that balance worked, um, though if he were writing it uh, to be read in the newspaper, he, he and his speechwriters might have done something quite different. Okay, good, thank you. Let's move ahead then. <clears throat> well, this is John Kennedy's inaugural address, uh, which was given just a couple of days later after Eisenhower's farewell address. It's again a ceremonial address, but it is deliberative in the sense that he makes some arguments in it about what the country should do and he creates, I think, a kind of ethos in this address because he says not only will he try to do these things, but ultimately it is the entire uh, country that needs to do them. And that creates a certain kind of solidarity in the speech. The speech has these marvelous um, phrases, let us begin anew, let us never negotiate out of fear. And that creates a sense not of, of forcing somebody to do something or telling them to do something, but that it's going to be you and me, all of us together, we're going to be able to do this. And it has, again, this theme of creating hope. It has, again, this theme of looking forward to the future, but of doing it together. It begins with a look back at the Declaration of Independence. That's something about this inaugural which is often forgotten. But Kennedy begins it by saying that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. As James Madison said, it was a, a revolutionary idea in history to say that it were, was a free people who gave a charter to power. And it wasn't power that had given a charter of freedom to people. In other words, the true source of freedom comes from the existence of the people themselves themselves 
it comes from the fact, as Kennedy says, that it derives from the hand of God. It's not something that's created by human beings. It's intrinsic to us because we are human. It, it's a truly revolutionary idea. He says we can't forget that. So he says, let the word go forth. He doesn't say, I send the word forth. He says, let the word go forth from this time and place. And then there's this marvelous balance and this alliteration, the repetition of sound. To friend and foe alike, let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, to assure the survival and the success of liberty. These short words, these monosyllables, many of them, and the simple repetition of sounds at the beginning of two or three words, and the balance of the phrases, pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, create an almost hypnotic, uh, incantatory sense. And it's very effective. I think it's also quite effective in writing, too. So let us begin anew, remembering on both sides, because he, he's talking really about both parties, but here he's talking about the communist world and the free world, remembering on both sides that civility is not a sign of weakness and sincerity is always subject to proof. I like that, sincerity is always subject to proof. I've often wondered if that was a kind of source for what Ronald Reagan later said, trust but verify, because that's essentially what Kennedy is saying here. Um, sincerity is always subject to verification. And then this next sentence uh, that apparently was suggested to him by John Kenneth Galbraith, let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. A stylistic uh, inversion of words, very, very effective here, a very memorable line. So in your hands, my fellow citizens, more than mine. And here he's creating a kind of ethos by leading people, but by also saying, I'm leading, as it were, not by telling you what to do, but by hoping that we together will find a way. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And it's true that he did, in a way, steal this from the motto of his high school, the Choate School in Connecticut. That's a fact. That, that school had a motto ask not what your alma mater can do for you, but what you can do for your alma mater. Kennedy remembered that for years. He put it in the speech himself, and it became one of its more famous lines. The next sentence, often not quoted, but it again goes to this globalization theme that we find in so many speeches. It's really a, a world, and the world existence of freedom that is important, not just in the United States alone. Kennedy drives that home even more in this famous speech at the Berlin Wall in June of 1963. He begins by saying, long ago the proudest boast was, I am a Roman citizen. Today, in the world of freedom, the proudest boast is, ich bin ein Berliner, I am a Berliner. So he says, you know, what is true of this city is true of Germany. So one question you might ask is, um, how does he get Berlin and Germany to stand for freedom everywhere? How does he make Berlin into this symbol? That's what he's really doing. Because he's shifting from actually just one part of one city to one country to the entire world and mankind. It's a marvelous progression because, of course, during the time of the Berlin airlift, West Berlin had been cut off. It had been sustained by nothing but airplanes flying in and out. So Kennedy says, if you really want to see freedom, look to West Berlin. And it's an emblem of freedom everywhere. The last part of this address, right near the end, is again a wonderful syllogism, a purely logical statement. He says, all free men 
wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. Now you can say, well, that's not factually true. And of course it isn't, but by now in the speech, he has made Berlin a representative of all human freedom because it has struggled to maintain it. So he's saying in essence that if you're free, you have shared that struggle and you have supported it. And since I am free, and therefore as a free man, I take pride in the words that I am a Berliner. Ich bin ein Berliner. So although you can say, well, it isn't strictly true, it's what in logic we would call valid. That is to say, if you admit that all free men are citizens of Berlin and that you are free, then you too are a citizen of Berlin. Every free person in the world is a citizen of Berlin. Well, you can imagine the Berliners who felt threatened went wild because they said, this is great. What Kennedy is saying is that everyone is a Berliner. It isn't possible now that America is going to abandon us. It just won't happen. And this speech, of course, was given as the uh, um, wall uh, was going up. And it caused Kennedy to scrap the speech he was going to be given and, in essence, one of the shortest time spans for any presidential speech. In about 24 hours, this speech was written. Very few other great presidential speeches have been written in such a short time. Ronald Reagan's speech for the Challenger astronauts may be one written by uh, Peggy Noonan, uh, a really wonderful tribute to the Challenger astronauts. So Kennedy using logic here, using symbol and Really, it's a very short speech, but it's a wonderful speech because it creates this enormous sense of freedom is everywhere. And if you take the embattled freedom one place, it becomes symbolic of the freedom everywhere. Here's LBJ talking about voting rights in 1965. The first part of what I put up on this slide is a rebuttal. That's the part of the speech in which he's addressing those who feel that the Voting Rights Act is not necessary. So he does it quite quickly. He says, to those who seek to avoid action by their national government in their own communities, in other words, those who say we don't want the federal government meddling, who want to seek and maintain purely local control, the answer is simple. Open your polling places to all your people extend the rights of citizenship to every citizen of this land. He has in his speech earlier said that experience has shown, that is past fact, has shown that the likelihood of this happening in the future is very small. Then he creates ethos by talking actually about his experience when he was young teaching in a poor community in Catula, Texas. And when he taught, <coughs> He says he walked home later in the afternoon, wishing there was more I could do for these poor students. Somehow, he says, you, not I, it's interesting he uses you, somehow you never forget what poverty and hatred can do when you see its scars on the hopeful face of a young child. This was a speech to a joint session of Congress. It was very successful. Uh, Johnson got the voting rights. Uh, act passed, and of course that's an act that has continued to be renewed, although at times contested all the way down to the present day. I want to look quickly at um, Jimmy Carter's so-called malaise speech and then one of Ronald Reagan's speeches. Um, Jimmy Carter never used the word malaise in this speech, but he spent much of the first part of the speech telling the American people that America was not doing well. Now, I admire Carter as, a, as a, a president and as a former president, but I include this speech because I think it was a mistake in tone. He says America was in a crisis of confidence, growing doubt, erosion of confidence, destroying the social and political fabric, losing faith, losing confidence. Too many of us are consumerist. The symptoms of this are all around us. That's most of the first part of the speech. It was very dispiriting in many ways. And only near the end does he say, we are strong, we can regain our unity. Not we will, but we can. But even then he begins to undercut it by saying, 
little by little, we can and we must rebuild our confidence. Carter was a sincere person. The country wasn't doing well when he gave the address. And there was a momentary sense that the address was helpful, but then it soon was hung around his neck as the Malay's speech. I think because it did not instill hope, it did not really elevate confidence. He attempted to do it, but the speech did not succeed. Of course, Ronald Reagan, very shortly after that, capitalized on it in accepting the Republican nomination, blames the Democrats for lack of moral responsibility and imputes to the Democrats and to Carter the idea that America has had its day in the sun, passed its zenith, and the future will be one of sacrifice and few opportunities. Carter didn't exactly say that, but Reagan characterized it that way and then says, I utterly reject that view, and then goes on to a much more positive and upbeat tone. Whatever one might think of Reagan's policies, rhetorically, this was very successful because it used feeling and inspiration and a contrast in tone with Carter's speech and with Carter's administration to some degree. And then Reagan really put the icing on the cake when at the end of the speech, he actually quoted from a Democrat, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, about waste and spending in government from FDR's own nomination acceptance speech. So I include the Carter and the Reagan just as a way to remind us all that there's a back and forth in a lot of American political rhetoric. And if you stumble a little, somebody else is going to catch you out at it. And I think in that so-called Malay speech, Carter did stumble a bit, and he paid a political price for it. Barack Obama's um, address to the world's Muslims is, again, a five-part address. He has a short introduction and, and a narration which explains why the U.S. and the Muslim world is at a time of mistrust and that no single speech can eradicate this mistrust. He establishes ethos by talking about his own experience. He says he's a Christian, but that he you know, lived for a while in Indonesia, that he worked in Chicago, that he had a family that had generations of Muslims in it. So he has known Islam on three continents. He's establishing a kind of credibility here in the speech itself, because people probably would not have known this, and he feels he needs to mention it, and does. So he says, let there be no doubt, Islam is part of America. It's part of his argument, and uh, we share things, and we share hope, uh, but we have to do something. Words alone aren't enough. And then he actually has an argument, which if you look at, contains seven divisions. He talks about extremism, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, nuclear weapons, democracy, religious freedom, women's rights, and economic development. So a lot of the speech is um, a strong argument. Um, but then there's a refutation as well. Um, he says, I know there are many who question uh, what we are trying to do in working together. But he says, you, especially you young people, because he realizes there's so many young people in the Muslim world, such a large percentage of its population, you have the ability to remake the world. And then at the end, he turns to common ground and to the future and to the fact that the people that he's talking to, Muslims, Jews, Christians, are all what traditionally has been called people of the book. That is to say, people who share some common ground in their religious traditions. And so he ends his address with that, uh, that closing, a, a really a religious closing. It's a long address, but it's quite remarkable if you look at its uh, various parts and break it down. Another example of probably not wanting to give the entire address to a class, but breaking down certain parts of it. Jim, mm -hmm. if we could go back, <clears throat> we can go back to the, the first slide of Obama's speech. There's a phrase, there's a passage there I'd like to just focus on for a moment. Right there. Um, it, it, one, one, I found when I taught one good, uh, one tactic for teaching things like this would be to ask your students to, to say in other language the same idea. So for example, when Barack Obama is saying, as a young man, I worked in Chicago communities where many found dignity and peace in their Muslim faith. He could have said, as a young man, I worked in Chicago where there were many Muslims. Instead, 
he chose to phrase it that way and juxtapose dignity, peace, and faith in the same sentence, clustering around the idea of Islam. That, I think, is very skillful use of language. It is, and I think uh, it comes from his own direct experience where many people in that community did find uh, a security and a dignity in that faith. So it establishes a link also between what is basically his, his home, his own home community, and the entire Muslim world. It also reminds everyone, as he says soon after that, in the next slide, if we could uh, go to that, he says, Islam is part of America. In other words, Islam is not in opposition to the United States, that there are many Muslims in the United States. And as with all of the other religious traditions that exist in the country, Islam is part of the country as well. So there's a sense of community that he's building here. And he fans it out even to what he calls the hope of all humanity. It's again the theme of globalization, despite tension, the theme that there are certain things that can be achieved together if we put our minds and our hearts to it. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end. Let me ask, are there any final questions or comments to be made uh, this evening before we wrap things up? Let me take this opportunity, Jim, to thank you very much. That was an excellent seminar. I really enjoyed it. I learned a good deal. I hope our participants did. Well, you've all been very patient, and, and thank you for being part of the seminar. I hope it helps you in your teaching. I think it, I think it will. Uh, it's, it's taught me, if I were back in the classroom, I'd be using a lot of this material. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank all of you for your participation this evening. Uh, we have uh, more schedules coming up, uh, more seminars coming up, rather. Please check our uh, seminar schedule. We've posted some new ones, and we'll be posting some more um, in the next uh, few weeks, uh, looking ahead to the spring. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I appreciate your uh, joining us this evening, and I hope to uh, be with you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.